have you look at your bulletins this morning for a minute and um, note just a couple of things. There's an insert from the missions committee that we really encourage you to read and um, it's on Scotland's home assignment that they will be flying out on the 2nd of January and needing to do some um, minimizing exposure before they leave. So um, we encourage you to spend some time with them um, early in the month and um, read through that um, letter. The other announcement that Stacy would like to have you remember is that committees need to submit their budget requests for next year by the 20th of December. So that's coming up. And uh, each committee needs to prepare their budget. Let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful for your goodness and provision. We thank you that we can meet here this morning. And I just pray for grace for our families, many of whom have um, had to change plans for Christmas and won't be able to be with extended families in the way that they normally are. Just think of um, Jen and Barry's family spending this time with us rather than with Barry's family. And I pray that you will give grace and that you will meet our heart's needs. Thank you for your promise to be with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Mark 1, 1 to 8, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. We light this candle to remind us of, of how the way was, in, was prepared for Jesus' coming. We hope that as Advent light increases, our own readiness may also increase. Let us pray. God of the prophets in the wilderness of Jordan, you sent a messenger to prepare people's hearts for the coming of your son. Help us to hear the good news, to be truly sorry for our sins, and to welcome the Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
this time. Oh, man. 
Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to be with you again this morning. And, uh, ouch. <laughs> um, yeah, it's great to, to be able to be uh, with you again this morning. And this morning, um, hope you have your Bibles ready. Uh, everyone, it would be good if you had a Bible. It would be good if we're searching the Scriptures together. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of searching today, and we're going to be trying to, I don't know if it's more like a Bible study, or I don't know, I don't really like sermons, but anyway, we're going to be studying the scriptures together, so um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that we still have the opportunity to, to, to meet together, to fellowship together, to worship together, and Lord, whether we're here or whether we're um, at home um, Lord, you are with us. We are your temple. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and you dwell in us. And you don't, you're not confined to the walls of this building, but Jesus, you are far greater. And so as you dwell in us, and as we remember this Christmas season of you coming to dwell with man, this Emmanuel, God, I pray that this morning as we look at this topic, um, God, that you would be honored and that it would somehow... Uh, give us a new appreciation, a new understanding, or just reaffirm things that we've already believed for many years about who you are and about um, the centrality of Christ, not only in this Christmas season, but in our lives and in your word. Thank you for this time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, this morning, uh, this might seem a little weird as we're coming up for Christmas, and I'm sure Barry would have had a really good Advent sermon to go along with this Christmas this season. Um, my focus this morning, I want us to, to think about the centrality of Christ. Um, and what I mean by that is just really a Christ-centered perspective. And one of the things that, that I've been feeling that God has been doing, and I'm going to share a little bit of my testimony a little bit in the last couple of years of what God's been doing in my heart. But one of the things that I feel like we don't get a lot, a lot of chance to talk about is this word, confession. Now, as I say that word, what happens inside of you? You know, as we think about the word confession, I'm sure there's kind of a, ooh, an awkwardness, or, uh-oh, where's he going to go with this? I hope this doesn't turn into a... <laughs> um, Perhaps an uncomfortableness about that word, or perhaps even shame. There might be shame attached to that word. There's a lot of negative feelings that come with that word confession. And uh, this morning, I want us to look at, at what confession is, and I want us to look at what confession, the purpose of confession, and where it takes us to, and then whether or not it's even important. Um, and I, when I'm talking about confession here, I guess one of the things I thought, maybe the first thing to do was to go and look at a definition. Okay, so we're going to go to Webster's Dictionary, and we're going to look at what is a definition of confession? And Webster says that a confession is a written or spoken statement in which you say that you have done something wrong or you've committed a crime. Okay, I'm sure we'd like to hear more confessions in regards to the break-ins and entries of what's happening in our community. But that would be the nature of it, sort of a, a penal type of, of understanding. The second meaning that they gave was the act of telling people something that makes you embarrassed. <laughs> There's the shame part. Right? You confess something, an embarrassing moment um, may or may not be harmless, don't know. The third one that Webster's had was the act of telling your sins to God. Or uh, in our, perhaps in our more Catholic cousins, uh, telling your sins to a priest. So th that was sort of Webster's definition of confession. It was this statement or um, the act of telling um, our wrongdoings, whether it's to you know, the police or the courts or to God himself or to a priest. And that is very true in our, in the, in the, Scripture's understanding of confession. But there's one that Webster doesn't get here that we find in, in, in the Bible. And so first, first of all, we'll go back to what a more traditional understanding of confession. We do see that confession in the Scriptures um, sort of matches the first and, and third definition of Webster, that it's a spoken statement to God which we say we have done something wrong according to God's laws. We've sinned, we've broken His law. 
And, and we see passages like Psalm 32 where uh, David says, I acknowledged my sin to you, God, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgress transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So that's, that is a very strong understanding of confession, and probably the most likely one that you and I understand when we think about confession. The second understanding of confession that Webster doesn't get here is, um, is, is the idea of alignment, the idea of agreement with what is true. Now, I'm not sure why Webster didn't get this. Maybe he thinks of it more of a test, you know, our testimony is, is, is when we're aligning or we're agreeing with something that is true. But in, in the scriptures, it uses the word confess many times when we're agreeing with something that is already true. Our agreement doesn't make it true. It's just that we've come to a new understanding, a new, uh, a new realization of what truth is. And so in second, in, sorry, in 1 Timothy 6, we... Here's this passage, Paul's writing to Timothy, a young man, and he says, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses, in the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. See, even Jesus made confession. Timothy made confession. A few Sundays ago we saw some youth make confession, and I think pastor even said, I baptize you, based on this confession, I baptize you. Okay, it's this acknowledgement, this alignment with what is already true in our declaration that we believe that thing to be true. Webster totally missed the ball on this, but this, this is what scripture sort of identifies as, as what, what confession is. It's that spoken or written uh, uh, statements that we have done something wrong, that we have broken God's laws, that we are sinful, and second, that we are aligning ourselves to what we have come to realize as truth. There's another one in, in regards to that alignment, Romans 10, 9 and 10, where I'm talking about if you confess with your mouth and believe and with that Jesus is Lord and believe in your hearts that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You see, there's there's a dual understanding of confession here. And so as we, as we set this foundation of trying to understand what is confession, those are sort of the two definitions that we're going to be working with today. So, what is the purpose? What is the purpose of confession? And, and, and this is going to help us draw out what our role and what, what we should be gleaning from this understanding of confession. In order to understand purpose, Purpose uh, has tied within that word sort of a starting point. Our purpose is to do this. Our purpose is to move this direction. Our purpose is, is where we're going. But we got to know where we're starting. When you're starting out on a journey, a road map is really helpful to know where you're starting from so that you know how to get to Calvary. If you don't know where you're starting from, you're just going to pick a random. We're going to start from here. That doesn't help you get to Calvary. You have to know where you're starting from. And so where are we starting from? And I want us to go together to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. We're going to be starting in this passage. And I know it's going to sound like we're going to be bouncing around a lot. I thought about doing a sword drill this morning with everybody. But uh, I don't know. If we all had microphones, maybe we could do that. But... <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2, this is the starting point. When it comes to confession, this is where we're starting as human beings, okay? Paul writes to the Ephesian church, as for you, he's talking to the Ephesians, but also to us, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were objects of wrath. Okay? So in this passage, Paul is saying the starting point for we as human beings in our sinfulness and our sinful nature is we are dead. <laughs> we are objects of wrath. Whose wrath? God's wrath. Okay? We are those objects that 
you know, he's throwing things at me, I guess. I don't know. He's going to, you know, that's his idea. This idea, this picture of you're the object of wrath. You're the, the object that gets beaten. You're the object that is going to be punished to be to the outpouring of his wrath. We are those objects. If we jump over to Romans chapter 3, jump over just a few books. Romans chapter 3, we're going to spend a little bit of time here, obviously. Romans 3, verse 10. Okay, we're building a foundation, and each of these are bricks in our foundation of understanding. Romans chapter 10. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who, need, who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Okay? So here's another understanding of, of our starting point. Worthless. Okay? We, we are fallen away. We have turned away. Okay? We, have, we don't have understanding. We don't have it. Okay? If you jump over to Romans 3, um, Romans 3.23, then a few verses over, I this one most children would know. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have fallen short. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift, okay, we won't even go there yet, the wages of sin is death. Okay, this is the starting point. This is our understanding when we are coming to this topic of confession. We are dead. We have become worthless. We have no understanding. We are broken. We are sinners. Sounds pretty grim, doesn't it? Sounds pretty, I don't want to be there. But this is the reality, okay? This is the reality check that Scripture does for us. Um, and so as we think about this reality, and we think about what is true, what is true is that before Christ, in our sinful state, we are dead. There is nothing good. We cannot generate goodness that would demand or expect God to pour out his favor on us because of some inherent good in us. No. We are dead. We are corpses. Then enters confession. Okay, this is where we bring confession now into. First John 1 John 1.9, if you jump over the Near the, towards the end, just before Revelation, we have 1 John 1, 9. A very common passage again. John is writing, uh, yeah, and he's saying, 1 John 1, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Okay, that's that first understanding, isn't it? That statement of confession. I'm confessing my sins. I'm confessing how I've broken God's law so that God may then forgive me. Okay, it's that second understanding. However, does God need us to confess to Him? This was a question that I've been grappling with over for a little while now. Is, is there a, you know, does God need us to confess? What is the purpose of confession? Is it to satisfy God? Does God need that confession in order to feel better about himself or satisfied. And I kept thinking about it. I'm like, okay, where are some examples in Scripture? And one example is the Samaritan woman. Okay, the Samaritan woman, Jesus comes to her, and there's this whole dialogue about, I am the living water, and if you drink from me, you'll no longer thirst. And he's, he's setting her up. He's kind of, for her to confess. And she kind of fails the test, doesn't she? She doesn't confess. And in fact, he has to point it out and say, actually, you're right, you're not married. You've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now isn't your husband. He's like, ha, I caught you. I don't think Jesus was like that. But Jesus, why did Jesus do that? What is the purpose of confession? Is it to satisfy God? Or is there something about confession that is actually for us? Another example is King David. Right? We know the story of King David and Bathsheba, and he sends Uriah off to the heaviest fighting, knowing that Uriah will be killed because his soldiers will leave the front line and leave Uriah there so that he dies. And then Nathan, the prophet, comes to David and says, there was this man with this sheep. And we know the story of it. And he, this sheep died, so he took the poor man's sheep, and he raised it as his own. And David's like, death to that guy. And Nathan says, you are the man. And then later, we see in 
Psalm 51, we see David's confession. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Confession, I believe, and that we see in Scripture is this recalibration, okay? this realignment of, of our understanding of who we are. I think sometimes we can begin to, to think, oh, I'm a pretty good person. I do this and I do this. And, and yeah, what do I really need to confess? Maybe David was thinking, I'm king. I can do whatever I want. I don't need to confess anything. And yet God uses confession to, bring, to shed light on truth, to kind of that reality check of don't forget who you are. Don't forget of your beginning. Don't forget of how you... Why do you need me? You are not satisfactory on your own. You are worthless without me. You are dead without me. And so I want to use this word as this, align, this sort of synonym with confession of um, recalibration. Now, I don't think recalibration is a word. I think calibration is the word. <laughs> but I'm going to use recalibration just so in our helping us re understand that there's a re. There's always a going back to recalibrating re-understanding what is true north, what is true, what is reality when it comes to our standing before God, and that we deserve death, and that we were already dead. But confession, this recalibration, it puts us into uh, the correct position in order now for God to do his work, in order for God to use us, okay? You have our reality of who we are as humans, Confession, which is the recalibration in order for God to use us. Confession, again, is another image. I think confession, can you think of confession as sort of the hammer and chisel, okay, of our sinful nature. Every time we are, you're right, confession is awkward. Confession is fearsome. Confession is uncomfortable, okay? Those are the hammers and the chisels to our to our sinful nature that allow us now to position ourselves to be used by God so that we can now be truly used. Confession removes the rose-colored glasses. I'm trying to use a lot of images here. Confession removes the rose-colored glasses that somehow there's goodness in me. Somehow there's something worthwhile in me. And it removes those rose-colored glasses and says that are deceiving us, that they're that there is some merit in me. But we confession removes those. And perhaps another word that we can use with that removal is that humility. We are humbled when we confess because we know what we really are, what we truly are. And so there's this idea of recalibration, of knowing what is true north, this idea of hammering and chiseling. It's hard work, it hurts, but it breaks us free so that we might be able to be used by God. And secondly, it removes those rose-colored glasses so that we can truly see things for what, they, for what they really are. But there's another reason for confession. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 16. The statement that God, I've wronged you, I need you. And that's a very traditional uh, evangelical understanding of confession. Getting right with God. Um, but there's another act of confession. And if we jump over to Matthew chapter 16, okay, and again, this is, a, this is a common passage, Matthew chapter 16. So, Jesus is now with his disciples, and they've come to Caesar Philippi, and he asks his disciples, this is in verse 13, who do people say the Son of Man is? Verse 14, the disciples replied, some say you're John the Baptist, others say you're Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? Jesus asked them. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, 
You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Haiti will not overcome it. Okay? This is a confession. We call this Peter's confession, perhaps even his, his conversion. But he confesses that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. This idea of there was new information, new enlightenment, alignment that Peter agreed with that Jesus was God. Sort of that second understanding of, of confession. Right? So this recalibration of who is Jesus, that's what we need to do. That's what our confession does, is it recalibrates us to understand who is Jesus. Okay, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5. If you're writing these down, these are excellent passages throughout the week to be studying as we look at this a little more, Ephesians 2, chapter, or sorry, chapter 2, verse 5. We're going to finish this passage, right? We're there before we're going back. Remember, it started with, you are dead in your trespasses. You are objects of wrath, but God. Okay? It's not because then we started doing good works. It was, but God, in verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, transgressions, when we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Okay, do you notice how anytime there's an action, it kind of seems to be that Christ Jesus comes after? Anytime there's anything good in our lives, there's like this little Christ Jesus at the end of it. <laughs> For some reason, it's not based on my merit or anything else. It's God did this through Christ Jesus. Okay, there's always this. For it is by grace you have been saved. Verse 8. Through, as far as by grace you have been saved. Through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared beforehand. The centrality of Christ in our confession gets our eyes off ourselves and sets our eyes upon Christ. Okay? Who is, if Hebrews 12, who is the author and finisher of our faith. Okay? The, what confession does for us is it gets our eyes off of ourselves. It gets our eyes off of our earthly problems. And it helps push our eyes up to God. It helps push our eyes up to Christ. And as, as I'm looking up, I don't see any of this around me. But all that really matters is what I see through Christ. And that's what confession does. Confession is the reality check that we are broken, fallen, and that through humility, we turn our eyes to Christ, knowing that there's nowhere else to run except Him. Christ becomes the center. Confession pushes us. Confession moves us to Christ to keep our eyes fixed. On him. We are guilty of tr tr trespasses against God's law. The law exposes our sin. Okay, we know that. That's the reality. The law is the reality. It's broken. It must be justified. Number two, it is only through Christ that our reality changes. And all we all we do, all we're doing is affirming what is already true. That we set our hearts, Galatians 3, we set our hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you have died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Okay, this is the scripture telling us to set our eyes on heavenly things. Get our eyes looking up. Get our eyes off of each other. Get our eyes off of me. If you listen to people talk, especially in the church, you'll hear a lot of I and we and us. And there's a lot of humanity in our language. And we've got to get our eyes off ourselves and look up to Christ. And it's about Jesus. It's about Him. It's get our, we need to set our minds and our hearts on what is pure, what is right, what is holy. 
And it is confession that does that for us. Because it's a reminder of who we are. But that we're not left there. But God, who is rich in mercy, has seated us in the heavenly places. But there is another significant role of confession. And as I read these passages, I want you to look for a theme that is also connected to confession. Okay, there's a theme in all of these passages that we're going to read, and I want you to pay attention to them. We're going to read them together, but I want you in the back of your head to see what is, the, what is the theme that's linking them together? What is the action of confession? What is the effect of confession as we read these passages? Okay, we're going to go back to 1 John. <clears throat> 1 John chapter 1. Okay. Again, asking the question, what is the connection? What is what are we seeing is the is the repeated pattern in this? First John chapter one, starting in verse five. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie. And do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we do not, if we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in us. Let's jump over to James, James chapter 5. Okay, I want us to be looking for this theme. What is the theme that keeps coming up here? James chapter 5, verse 13. Is any one of you in trouble, he should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Let's jump over to Romans, Romans chapter 12. Okay, if you're thinking about what's, what's, I'm sure there's lots of connections and I'm really just looking kind of for the one, I know that's hard, but let's keep reading these scriptures, okay? This is God's word, this isn't my word, this is God's word, okay? Romans chapter 12, I love this passage, I think many of you do. Starting in verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, who are many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. He goes into talking about what these gifts are. Are we beginning to see a pattern here? Confession and something else. Right? And then we're going to jump back to the Matthew passage. Okay? Peter's confession. Matthew chapter 16. Okay? Peter's confession. They, Jesus asked them, who do people say? And then Jesus asked them again, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. 
And I will tell, and I tell you <clears throat> that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. These are just an example of a few passages, but as you look at this idea of confession and what's attached to it, there seems to be a connection between confession and how we function as the church. Okay? In every one of these passages, there's talk about the body. There's talks about one anothering. There's talk about building his church. Okay? There's this idea of the importance of confession and functioning as a church. I want us to read about an uncalibrated, an unconfessed church, a church where confession is not practiced, okay? An uncalibrated church, Galatians chapter 3. Okay, let's just jump over there. This is, these are sort of the negative examples of an uncalibrated, an unconfessing church, a church where confession is not practiced, okay? Chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, you are now trying to attain your goal by human effort. This is an uncalibrated church trying by their own merit, their own effort, not relying on that spirit of Christ to allow Christ to build his church. And he's asked, he's, you know, he even uses the word, who bewitched you? Who thought that there was anything good in you to be able to do this work? This is Christ's work. This is God's work. Let's look at James chapter 4. This is a pretty potent one. I Okay, and the reason I bring this stuff up is I'm going to share a story in just a minute, and I know this is hard, but James chapter 4, verses 1 to 12. Okay, this is an uncalibrated church, a church that doesn't practice confession. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think that scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely, but he gives us more grace? That is why scripture says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. This confession, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? These are examples of uncalibrated churches, churches that are unable, are not focused on the things of God. They have their eyes on each other, okay? They're comparing each other. This person has this and I want this. They're full of envy. Oh, that's not a good idea. We need to some, okay, there's just, they're uncalibrated. They're just back and forth like a ship on the sea and they're just looking back and forth to each other. They're all, but confession does what? Confession pushes us to Christ so that that no longer is in our spectrum, in our, in our, in our view, Okay? We need constant calibration in order to be effective as a church. <laughs> that sounds hard, doesn't it? When I, when I, I'm using the word calibration because I know that confession has some really hard things attached to it. Maybe we say it like this. We need constant confession in order to be effective as a church. Confession to one another is the hammer and chisel 
that maintains our ability to function as the church. I want to share with you a bit of a personal story. For a lot of years, I was feeling a lot of bitterness about the church that we work with in South Sudan. They were the, they were the uncalibrated church in James. There was fighting and quarreling, even to the point of threats of murder and as, you know, just crazy things. You wouldn't even believe it was true, and I was so disheartened. I said, God, I'm done with this church. I'm finished with it. I want to go do, start something new. There's got to be, this is, this is not honoring to you. This is not glorifying you. And I was really struggling with what to do with this, and it was a battle, and I, it was bringing me down lower and lower, and I was just feeling like, God, I don't know what to do. Your church has let me down. And it was at that point when Jesus, I felt like God was just, he said to me, he says, well, that's because you're looking to the church to satisfy you. You're looking to the church to try and, out of its greatness, out of its, all the wonderful things it does, all of its merit, that it would, it would make you satisfied. And he said, don't love the church because of what it gives you or what it does for you. Love the church because of who it belongs to. And that totally changed my life. Because all of a sudden, it wasn't about the people that I was looking at and seeing and all of the mess. There was good there too, but usually the mess overshouds the, the good stuff. And all of a sudden, my eyes were just pushed and it says, love the church because of who it belongs to. And at that moment, all of a sudden, all these people who I'm trying to work with, it doesn't matter anymore because I know they have value because of who they belong to. I know that this church that we're struggling with and we're searching, we're, we're, work, you know, we're striving together, we're walking life together, there's sin and it's broken and it's dirty and it's messy. Jesus knows. He promised that he was going to build his church. I'm not the builder. I'm not the owner of it. I'm not the bridegroom of the church. How dare I think the church somehow belongs to me? that somehow I'm here to fix the church or to make it what it should be. This is his church. And that completely changed my ability to be able to love. And it freed me. It was freeing now to be able to serve and to, to, to walk life because it wasn't about this person's, my expectations of them or whatever. It was about what Jesus was doing. And this was exactly what Jesus wanted and he was going to do it and I just need to trust him. We are not the church because of anything we have done or are doing currently or will do in the future. We are the church because of who we belong to. And confession pushes us back to that reality, to that understanding, to that position where we know who we are, we know where we've come from, and it is but God, it is through Christ that we are able to serve. I think sometimes I'm not talking about, I'm just talking about the church in general. As the church, we are too focused on what the church offers me. The church, to be honest, and I don't know, we can debate this later, but the church offers you nothing. The church offers us nothing. But the one to whom the church belongs, the one who is building his church, the one to whose body we belong, offers us everything. The church, is not about, the church is not about receiving. It's about service. It's about generosity. It's about walking life together. It's about one anothering. It's about being the body. And confession pushes us into that ability where we can now do that without comparison, without expectations, without disappointment, without hurt. Confession frees us so that we can serve as we were created to serve. The centrality of Christ in the church. We maintain our ability for fellowship through confession and repentance. Okay? And it's awkward. 
It hurts. It's a chiseling. Okay, sometimes recalibration doesn't feel comfortable. It's like, no, I want to go this way, but I know I need to come back to the center. I need to come back to true north because myself, my fleshly desire, my, those, those, that, that battle within me is wanting to pull me this way. And so it requires what? When we want to do something we don't want to, it requires discipline. This is where the spiritual discipline of fellowship, the spiritual discipline of unity comes in. We maintain our ability for fellowship through confession and repentance. This recalibration which comes through confession. The spiritual discipline of unity. I've never even thought about it before. This was something that came to me uh, like a few weeks ago. You know, we talk about fellowship, whatnot, but the spiritual discipline of unity. I think sometimes in my head I've had it where unity needs to be easy. It needs to just like flow naturally. It needs to be just something that we just love in bubbles. That's a friend, South African friend always greets me, love and bubbles, and I'm like, ah, I don't get that. Okay, so love and bubbles, you know, it's not that. It requires hard work. It requires confession. It requires us getting our eyes off of each other and off of myself and onto Christ. When I don't live a confessional life, my head gets in the way, <laughs> okay? I begin to think too highly of myself. I begin to think that there's something that I'm doing that's, really worthwhile and it's at confession that brings me back to reality so our, t our understanding today of confession is twofold confession of our sin to God and to each other keeps us humble it keeps us in reality that we are incapable of actually doing anything good on our own okay it's a recalibration a re-understanding it's a reminder of who we are of who we truly are Secondly, confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, keeps our eyes fixed on him so that everything and everyone else loses its power and influence over us. Did that make sense? When our eyes are fixed on Jesus, everything and everyone else loses its power over us. We are now able to submit ourselves to God. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another. Here's another passage about, you know, bearing with one another. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. This is one body and one Spirit just as you were called to one hope when you, were when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So, is confession important? <laughs> Do we believe that confession is important? I think the scriptures points out that confession is very important. It's important not only in our standing before God that we may have hope of a future salvation, but it also allows us to be able to love one another, to serve as the church is meant to serve, and to have unity. What are we confessing? <laughs> well, yeah, we confess our sins to God. We confess our wrongs to each other. But I think more importantly, we confess the idolatry in our lives. When we have put other things in front of Christ. When we've allowed our gaze to come down and I've cared too much about what this person thinks of me or what I need to perform here or what this situation, okay? That's idolatry because my eyes have now left the one to whom all of this belongs to, who I belong to. My eyes have left that and I've gotten distracted. And that's where the confession comes in. Jesus, I'm sorry that I've cared too much about what this person thinks. I've cared too much about trying to to do this and not trusting you with it. I confess that I have tried to make your church what I want it to be and not what you want it to be. Confession. And so that's a little bit of, of where we are today as we think about, is it important? Do we need to develop a habit of confession? 
Do we need to, to develop the spiritual discipline of unity and, and uh, fellowship and working together? And what's it going to cost? What's it going to take? What hard work needs to be done in order to maintain this? Jesus said, I will build my church. Jesus said he was going to prepare for himself his bride. And it's in that that I function, that I need to function as I head back to Africa. That this is his bride. This is, he's preparing it. He's making it what he needs it to be and what it's going to be. And that on that day, it will be presented to him pure and spotless. Not because of what I've done, but because of what he's doing. Let's pray. Jesus, this morning I confess to you that I have tried to make your church something that I need it to be and not trusting you, that you're going to do it, that you're going to follow through on it. I confess my lack of trust. I confess my idolatry. I confess that I've cared too much about what other people think and say and do, that it binds me, that it enslaves me. And yet, Jesus, you call us to freedom. But the only way we can be free is by, by keeping our eyes fixed on you, that you are authoring our faith, that you are authoring your church, that you are purifying us in your church. And you will present it to yourself one day, pure and spotless. God, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you and not be tempted or distracted by letting our focus get down to sort of this heavenly human world, but that we would set our eyes fixed on you. We love you, Lord, and we give our lives to you in service. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Remembering you in my prayers, I keep asking that the God of our Father, sorry, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, 
which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. May God answer this prayer for us.